My name is Jacek Bartoszek. Welcome to Strategy and Future. Welcome to episode two of Flows and Frictions. Joining me today is Jacek Bartoszak, who I think uh, needs no introduction. Uh, welcome to the show. Hi, hi, thanks. <laughs> um, so the idea that we're going to do today is we're going to do an ABC of geopolitics. Um, and I think we'll get straight into it. So I've, I've uh, prepared the ABC. So these are my um, ideas for what um, the, the word should be. And Jacek will, um, will explain um, geopolitics in terms of this uh, ABC. So A is for Alfred, first of all. Um, Jacek, um, can you can you guess who Alfred um, is? Uh, if A is for Alfred, okay. I understand that the concept is like you know following the flow, so to speak. Yeah. So Alfred, the first thing that uh, crossed my mind or you know, strikes me is Alfred Imahan, the prophet of the Pacific, and this the U.S. sea power, the lecturer at the U.S. Naval War College, and uh, actually the, the, the huge proponent of the U.S. Uh, presence on the world ocean. Uh, even there is a saying um, among the, the, the U.S. Navy sailors and crewmen that there is only uh, one God and it's uh, Poseidon, Neptune. Yeah? There is only one church and this is the U.S. Navy and there is only one legitimate prophet of this leg sole legitimate uh, church and this is Alfred P. Mahan. Okay, so um, so yeah, that's correct. Alfred um, in 1840 to 1914 um, uh, are the dates that I've got um, here for him. I suppose uh, he's um, a good way to talk about the importance in geopolitics of naval power, uh, naval history, naval strategy. Um, I believe that um, he was a naval historian, is that correct? I don't remember exactly what sort of rank he had. He was also an officer, but not of the highest ranks. And and he dealt with history and the naval strategy, like many others before him and after, after him. And uh, for sure, he had a huge impact on the thinking, on sort of establishing the way of thinking in the U.S., in those uh, Teddy Roosevelt times of uh, Grand White Fleet, of the need to phase out, by the way, Great Britain and British Empire and also Spanish Empire from the Western Hemisphere and to create the communication lines across the Pacific. And in order to do so, Americans and Mahan proposed to build the Panama Canal and also erasing the, the British presence in the, in the Western Hemisphere, that actually materialized. The Spanish presence was eradicated, eradicated in the aftermath of the U.S.-Spanish War of uh, 1898, and the British presence was eradicated because of the land lease program in the Second World War, where British were devastated by the sort of the loss and impact and actually the, the effort that they had to, to shoulder why the Americans were actually the sole victors of this whole huge uh, clash between the continental power of Germany and the sea power of, of the English-speaking world. Okay, um, we'll move on to B. B is for Belarus. Um, Belarus has been in the news uh, a lot recently because um, John Bolton, um, I still I don't know if you visited Belarus. Uh, we talked about it on the first episode of Flows and Frictions with Nicholas Myers. Um, Belarus, obviously, also interesting to talk about because, um, because as Nicholas said last episode, it sees itself or it used to see itself as potentially the king of Belt and Road. So, B is for Belarus, also, maybe a little bit on Belt and Road as well. Belarus is for Poland and for Russia. Okay, with all proportions, you know, of course, uh, in proper uh, perspective to be kept. It's like for US and Mahan, the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. It's a buffer zone, a mode, a sort of a buffer 
that creates some strategic uh, breathing space against, for example, the Russian interference, the Russian power projection. And also Russians were afraid of that as well. Uh, Poles, Swedes, Germans and Napoleon marched through this buffer zone of Belarus of Russia into Russia as heartland. So Belarus is a sort of a is a, is a sort of a uh, pawn between Poland and Russia. Uh, you always need to control it in order to project power either to the maritime oriented Europe or to the Russian heartland. And uh, also the, the, the same impact uh, Belarus is having on Belt and Road, because if you take a look at the Eurasian landmass map and you see it from Shanghai or even Hong Kong, and you want to connect and create your supply chain, not across the world ocean, but across the landmass of Eurasia, overland route, you need to cross Belarus, Poland, Ukraine, you name it. Yeah. And of course, some political mosaic comes into play here with Ukraine out of the game, sort of. It's a deal Russia that is a pivotal uh, place. And also Poland. But Poland sticks with the US and with NATO. So it may be so that there will be, if the scaling of globalization and escalation of the trade and technology war between US and China intensifies, we might have a big wall and a tall wall on the Book River that is actually the border between Belarus and Poland. Okay, so um, B is for Belarus, it could equally be for Book um, as the, the river as well. Uh, moving on to C, C is for Crow. Uh, Crow is, of course, uh, Crow's memorandum, a famous memorandum issued, uh, prepared and issued at the beginning of the 20th century by one of the British diplomats, where uh, he explained to the king and the, gov and the British government actually what is the concept of the sea power and how the dominant sea power should behave in the world in order not to be balanced, in order actually to deny or to evade the, the process of creating a coalition, balancing its preponderant power. It stems from the fact that if you had a navy, actually you control the maritime highway of transporting the goods, cargo, and strategic flows. So usually dominant, the, 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 the proposal of Crow was that the dominant uh, sea power cannot, cannot show its power and uh, cannot show the muscles so much and so evidently because the other people on the continent, other nations, will be scared that they will be completely cut off the strategic flows and they will create a coalition against the power of Great Britain. That's why the, the best policy for the uh, British government would be to propose the freedom of navigation, propose the freedom of movement of strategic flows, and the British Navy would position itself as a guardian of this freedom. And that the, and then most of the nations that always wants want to trade to be connected will favor the this convenient position of Great Britain. Great Britain will not be viewed as an enemy, as a friction imposing power, but as an enabler, as someone of course stronger and more powerful, but someone enabling life, not prohibiting life. And this was the essence of this message. Awesome, actually awesome reasoning. Mm -hmm. Still uh, reflecting today. Yes, it's not, um, the Crow Memorandum is not very long, as I understand it. It's about 25 pages, maybe. Um, so it's a readable, um, a readable text. You don't need to spend a long time um, on it, obviously, because it's it's only a memorandum. Um, moving on to D. D is for deterrence. Um, uh, what can we say about deterrence? <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's the word that uh, sort of came to be forgotten over the last 30 years in this beautiful moment in the history of, of the world when there was one <clears throat> superior power of the United States 
enjoying its supremacy, so it didn't have to deter, so to speak. Deterrence is a posture, a strategic posture, where there are two powers, two or three powers, and they deter each other. Deterrence is, is a posture against being influenced and pressured by other power to do something that I don't want to do. It may be, actually at the end of the day, it comes, it boils down to the military punch and the military power. In the beautiful pieces of time, you don't think about the military too much, so you try to deter by your other influence, by economic power, by financial solutions, by your money, by, by your contacts with other people, trading, sort of your, your connectivity to others. But in terms of war, in terms of the, at the end of the day, it's all about the military power. So, for example, right now, uh, the NATO Eastern Flank, there is a concept of deterrence against Russia. So that Russia doesn't move forward, doesn't break the NATO system, doesn't infringe the independence of the Baltic states, of other states here. And that's why we, we need to show deterrence and to deter them from doing it so that they are either scared of the punishment, or, and this is deterrence by punishment, or they are scared or at least concerned that the losses they would be inflicted upon would be huge. So this is then the, 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 the deterrence by denial. So there are two versions of deterrence, deterrence by punishment and deterrence by denial. Punishment was quite evident during the Cold War. Both superpowers had a, actually a, a massive nuclear arsenals and they could annihilate each other. And that was deterrence by, by uh, punishment, meaning that nobody dares to attack first, to strike first, because they would be killed in revenge. Second strike capability. And deterrence by denial is all usually the option of the weaker parties, the weaker powers that want to deter the stronger power to attack them, impose on them, by showing that still we are, of course, weaker, but still we are well equipped and well prepared, and you will be bleeding. You will be bleeding anyway. So maybe, maybe. That's actually the, 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 the essence of the dance. Mm -hmm. um, e is for Eurasia. Um, this is um, a concept which is often talked about in um, the circles of, of geopolitics and not very often um, in, the, in the world outside um, geopolitics. I think this idea of Eurasia um, Many times when I uh, read um, geopolitical texts, I see that Europe is treated as um, a mere peninsula. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, and it's you know it's funny in a way because Thomas, you, you come from Manchester, mm -hmm. so, you, so you're English, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, so you're seamen, so to speak, using the this old word of material. And you have, you know, people in the in the West, especially ocean-oriented, sea-oriented people from the English-speaking countries, are having a, a peculiar approach to seeing the geography. Usually, they see geography from the sea, <laughs> so they see the coasts, the estuaries, and the big cities that usually are located on the shores, on the coasts. That's why when the British sailors sailed through the Mediterranean, they said, they were saying, okay, this is the continent. And this, that was a vague thing behind the mountains, somewhere behind the coast. And the inside of it was either of no importance, so the British sea power, its links, its connectivity, its commercial trade, or it was completely unknown to them. That's why there was this concept of Europe and Asia, because the British sailed from Europe to Asia <laughs> to seize those, you know, spoils and booties and all those things that were terrible. And they sailed around. And they sailed 
on the south part of it, uh, around the southern part of it, not the northern part of it, because it's Arctic. Arctic and it's, it's, it's cold because of the ice. And this is this constant, but in fact, in the history of uh, humanity, it was Eurasia that was uh, eth- the real thing. The last 500 years changed this perception. Actually, it's a one landmass, and Europe, Europe is a small peninsula in the west, a very peculiar, very much sea oriented, with a lot of bays, coastline that favored seafaring. And uh, the eastern part of Eurasia, it's a huge landmass, plain or with mountains, but huge landmass. But actually, it's one continent. You can walk from Beijing to Warsaw, while you cannot walk from Warsaw to London. And uh, the preponderance of the European people for the last 500 years created the impression that Europe is bigger, stronger, is a cent- you know, central point on the world map. And from this very fact stems the lack of concept of Eurasia. Plus Eurasia is being associated with the uh, evil. So it was the German Empire that wanted to create the Eurasian uh, connectivity railway between Berlin and Baghdad. Then in the Second World War also the Germans wanted to create the Eurasian Empire as opposed to the British Sea Power Empire. Uh, then they lost of course, uh, so it, it, it was spooky. And then there was this Eurasian, Northern Eurasian Empire of Soviet Union controlling the Hartman, Makinder Shahman. So they, those were bad people again. And of course, those bad people in Northern Eurasia, because of lack of connectivity, lack of trade, they didn't have the same chances for success. The, 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 you know, the power, the authority is being executed, in my personal opinion, in a different way. If you are in a landlocked, continental country, uh, with not so many resources and not so many connectivities, if your infrastructure needs to be built, either from scratch or it needs to be maintained over winter periods and so on, it costs money. While in England, all you have to do is to have the port and the, the water is free and it simply uh, keeps your ships afloat and you can transport your goods. It's a different stuff. So the, this whole concept of Eurasia is, uh, is, 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 is a little bit uh, sort of anchored in the past uh, fears and also in the future fears because if china builds this button road it will connect the whole of eurasia and then it will turn out that there is only one supercontinent and it is eurasia and it is connected under the hands of the chinese and the world ocean will not be that important anymore and this, this will be exactly in line with the uh, admonition that Hout of Mackinder gave more than 100 years ago, that if there is a new connectivity, airplanes, highways, cars, you know, railways, uh, connecting the landmass of Eurasia from China to Europe, then two lines of Eurasia, Europe and China, two most yielding, most producing uh, spaces in Eurasia will combine forces then the sea powers of the United States and and Great Britain would lose its preponderance. Okay, um, F is for fog. Let me give a little introduction to what I mean by this. Um, I think it's uh, Clausewitz, I'm not sure if I've pronounced his name uh, correctly, that came up with the concept of uh, friction. Obviously, the name of the podcast is Flows and Frictions. We talk a lot about um, flows here at Strategy and Future. Um, I guess we will also be talking about frictions um, as well. Um, Clausewitz, I believe, also came up with the idea of fog of war. Um, and I think that um, F is for fog. Uh, could be a nice um, way into this idea of, of talking about um, 
military um, planning and um, how things don't always go as, as they planned. Yeah. Fog of war, uh, uh, in line with what Klausowicz uh, stated, is the area of unknown. Actually, there is a very popular saying among the military that all plans do not survive the first contact with the enemy. And when you venture into the war, first of all, you don't know how it's going to end. And second, you will be surprised every day. And this is the fog of war. You don't know then actually how your enemy maneuvers. And there will always be surprise. You can't know everything. You can't see everything. And still you need to improvise. You need to plan. You need to make your decision based on intuition. And this is the, you know, the sphere of thought, the fog of war. This has a lot to do with the friction. Friction of war. Friction of war is something that you enter the war with a plan. And then there are so many things happening that actually the friction is there. You, you, you cannot do as you planned. And you need to come to terms with that. This, the war is a very chaotic thing. And you need to know how to maneuver within this chaotic, full of frictions <clears throat> and full of fog <clears throat> business. Okay. Um... G, changing the topic slightly away from uh, war towards um, diplomacy and, and politics, uh, G is for G20. Apparently it's um, exactly, nearly exactly um, 10 years ago that the G20 announced that it would replace the G8 as the main economic council of wealthy nations. I've got a nice quote here. Um, I'll, see if you, I'll see if you can guess who the quote is from. Um, and it's from 10 years ago. The quote is, everybody wants the smallest group that includes them. So if they're the 21st largest nation in the world, they want the G21 and think it's highly unfair if they've been cut out. Any idea who that quote's from 10 years ago? I have no idea. Barack Obama. Um, but you know, this, this is cool. But you know what the funny thing is? That Poland probably is this 21st, according to the GDP as far as I know, of course, it depends how we count it. We we are on the sort of the brink of being within G20, and of course, once you know, because we are not in, so it's difficult to get in now. But by sheer coincidence, this uh, statement by Barack Obama may may apply to Poland. Um, do you think um, how uh, how does Poland feel about the the G20? Um, does Poland think that the G20? Uh, there are different theories on this, aren't there? I think um, Ian Bremmer um, has um, the the name G0, I believe, is connected with this idea that there actually shouldn't be any um, group at all and that there should be a way of decision-making that um, doesn't involve uh, the, the biggest countries all getting together to make the decisions. Um, how do people in Poland um, feel about the idea of the G20? I don't think that there is a, a sort of profound debate about G20 simply because Poland has never been a part of the developed world uh, for the last 500 years. The G7, G8, you know, outside of Russia, it was a club of countries that actually took advantage of the Atlantic explorations and uh, created the world where they Flourished. And uh, the crisis that occurred uh, 10 years ago showed that this formula didn't work anymore and it had to include other countries so far developing and now they needed to be included in the decision making process. Of course, the question is really how far they were into the decision-making process and so on. But the reality was there that there was a, there was China that was big, there was Brazil, there were the, the world country and India there were countries that really matter on the on the economic scene of the world, and they were not included in this whole actually Western plus Japan club. 
and it had to change. I think it it it, it will change uh, shortly as well. Simply things change. Nothing stands still, as we know from the ancient uh, uh, writer, and uh, we simply need to come to terms with that. The question is uh, more important, more acute now in terms. Okay, let me put put, put aside some sort of a theatrical thing. Actually, it was the United States that was running the, the system. With a coalition of, of the Western powers that simply uh, succumb to the US uh, propositions, with some minor, minor exceptions. That was, ex you know, simplifying a little bit, that was the case since the Second World War. And uh, there was a reason why. Allegedly, there were delegations from the U.S. right during this crisis, arriving in Beijing, proposing G2, China and U.S. That would be running as two core countries of the global systems running that thing. But the Chinese said, no, we don't want it. The future will be decided by the answer, why? Chinese deny whether because they didn't want to show their strength or because they thought that they didn't need to show their strength because anyway they would be stronger than the US and they would not need to have G2 because they will have the France. And I think that after 10 years, this is the question that is more important, whether the Chinese are running for G1 than being the G1 only and sole member, or they really wanted to evade this US image. This is the, the question of our times. I've got a challenge for listeners. Um, if you pause the podcast, uh, try to think of all of the members of the G20. Um, you can test yourself on the challenge. We're not going to talk about which members um, uh, there are now. We're going to move on to H, which is for Halford. No, of course, Halford Mackinder, uh, that we have mentioned so many times during our conversations. Halford Mackinder, the British geographer and the father of geopolitics, so to speak. Um, I think he was also a head of the British uh, Geographical Society. I gave a few quite seminal speeches and wrote a few pieces and books uh, that resonate until today, especially in landmass of Eurasia. Uh, at that time, he was not heard by the British government. Uh, his proposals were not uh, followed after the First World War, but his uh, geopolitical formulas survived the, the entire 20th century, and I think they also resonate, and they were the, ma the main trigger, the main reason for the Chinese button road mission. And that created a, I mean, what can I say? Every second word uh, is about uh, Mackinder and his description of the world, he, this difference between the seafaring people and the Eurasian from landlocked people, how they govern themselves, how they react to the events. In my opinion, it's so true, even today. Especially, it's palpable here in Poland, where we speak now. As we are right in between the sea powers of the Atlantic and the continental powers of Eurasia, Poland is exactly at the edge where the European peninsula, with the law, with the coastline, with the, with the, with harbors ends. And right here begins the flat plateau, the plain of Eurasia, where masses of troops can, can gather. It's like a dry land corridor, vast as you can get it. So we are like a cork in a tub. Okay. So we understand Mackinder very well and his description of the world. Okay, so that's Halford McKinder, 1861 to 1947. I is for 
Iran. And uh, rather than talking about Iran in general, I'd like to focus on a specific point. Um, although if you want to expand it a bit, you can. Um, when I was compiling this list of um, terms, geopolitical terms and, and ideas and so on, um, I was thinking about C, before I had C for Crow, I was thinking about C for choke points. Um, would I be correct in saying that the Strait of Hormuz is a choke point? Yes, Iran has, has a say in two critical choke points. One critical, again, for the seafaring people, Strait of Hormuz, of which we hear so frequently. It can project power and try to cut off the freedom of communication through this strait because of proximity to the, the Persian Iranian uh, coast. And uh, with the use of anti external capabilities and the military technology that helps along the way the land, the land countries now, uh, they can really uh, impose friction on the freedom of uh, navigation. This is one thing, but Sometimes we, we tend to forget that there is another choke point. The whole Iran is a big choke point. If you take a look at the Eurasian landmass map, you can see that if, China, if the Chinese really are bent on building the Belt and Road, and under this, on building a new supply chain of the new world economy that is not on across the world ocean, and it's not dependent on the US Navy, then they need to do it either through Russia, and I, I bet they will not want to do it because well, they don't want it from Russia, they want it from China, or through Persia, through Iran. So this is the land choke point. And remember, there are always also land choke points. It's not only uh, in the waterways. Uh, there are ridges between the mountains, there are uh, valleys, uh, they are the river flows that opens or closes the approaches. And Iran is one big choke point, a pivotal place that could have a big say on the development of the I can, um, I can really see uh, from, from talking to you that the, the appeal of, um, of geopolitics is connected with the appeal of geography and um, there's a kind of romance about geography when you think about landscapes. The way, the for the same reason that we enjoy walking the mountains, for example, um, I can see how there's an overlap there between the um, the politics and the the romance of the of the, the world around us. I'm going to move on to Jay. Yeah, if, if, yeah, Jay yeah. Thomas, it's not only the romance; it's about the sling. Simply, you live within the space, and this space is imposing limits on you. You need to walk somewhere, you need to commute to your work. Distance is making you limited. Sometimes it allows you, sometimes it imposes frictions. That's why geography is a permanent feature in policy making. Plus threats are strictly related to distance and proximity to the big power that wants to impose its will on you. It's very easy to last or outlast the pressure. Poland can easily last the pressure from Argentina. We don't give a damn, so to speak. What can they do to us? Or from Fiji or from Australia. But it's not the case with, with Russia. It even seems that we can survive the pressure from China that is far away, although powerful, far, it's far away. It's, it, it's simply the correlation of distance and the cost related to power projection and also how you use your trade, there are communication lines, there are communication corridors, flows, strategic flows of trade and movement of people are occurring in particular places, not everywhere at the same time. J is for Japan um, in the same way that I was for Iran, but actually for, for choke points. I want to talk about Japan, um, not about Japan as a whole, but about maybe one uh, particular um, 
a particular part of Japanese history. Um, we'll have an article out on strategy in future um, soon, I think, um, on Lee Kuan Yew, who was the first uh, premier of Singapore. And um, I enjoyed reading uh, the part in the article about, well, I, I found it very interesting to read about the Japanese occupation of Singapore. It reminded me of um, the film Lawrence of Arabia, probably my favorite film. Um, the part when they're talking about the guns of Aqaba facing the sea and they need to attack Aqaba from inland. The Japanese occupation of Singapore sounded quite similar. Also, um, it sounded quite brutal um, as well. And um, I think the the history of Singapore has clearly been uh, shaped by the brutality of that occupation. So J is for Japan, but maybe we can also talk a little bit about Singapore. Yeah. The, the first impression that strikes me when I think of Japan is that this is the strongest and the staunchest and the closest ally of the United States in the world. With all everyday media noise not mattering too much, it's all about Japan. Japan is a great power, economic power horse, technological power horse. And it's actually it's in one almost one body with the United States. So this is the first thing. And the name the Japanese Navy is actually shaped and created to resemble the combined operations of the US Navy. No other ally of the United States in the 21st century has it. This is one thing. The second thing is that geopolitics is all about power in a particular in a particular economy. Japan was fighting the war against the United States for domination of the Pacific communication links. So once defeated and flipped and then helped to restore economy, it became the major sea ally of the sea of the ocean power of the United States, trying to contain both Japan and China. And it will serve the same role. How history is complex is the, the case of Singapore. When Japan wanted to eradicate, to remove both Great Britain from Asia and the United States from Asia, it had to strike them at the same time. So they struck, they struck the Pearl Harbor fleet and also Singapore. Singapore was the most expensive British facility port in the entire world built before the Second World War. Singapore has a critical geostrategic position on the world map. Arguably the most seminal, the most consequential. It guards the approach to the Malacca Strait. And this choke point, this bottleneck, controls all important strategy flows from Europe to Asia, from Asia to Europe, from Middle East and Africa to Asia and backwards. That's why British had to seize and control Singapore and they built the fortress. The problem was that it was attacked from the, from the land, not from the sea. The fall of Singapore destroyed the British Empire forever. The shock waves were huge. If you talk to the Australians, they never believed again that Great Britain would be restored. Actually, they wanted, they were thinking about flipping to, to the Japanese side. With the fall of Singapore, the Japanese fleet could, found itself in a position to project power to the south, to, to, to Australia, through Indonesian Straits and Southern Pacific. I mean, that was, uh, that was a massive blow to the British sea, sea colonial world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Great Britain never recovered from this, from this whole, even, after, even though it sort of in, 
alliance with the U.S. and Soviet Union defeated Imperial Japan and Germany. Yeah. Okay. Um, K is for Kriegspiel. Um, this is war gaming, I think, or war game in German. Um, so K is for Kriegspiel, and by extension, perhaps. We could talk about German uh, military history. We talked a little bit about Clausewitz um, earlier. Um, also, whilst we're on the topic of Germany, I've read that uh, geopolitics as a um, as a as a field um, of of interest um, suffered in uh, popularity in the aftermath of the Second World War <laughs> because people associated it with uh, Nazism and it was it was only revived um, in the 1970s by people like Kissinger and um, Zhezinski. So K is for um, Kriegspiel. Um, it could also maybe be for Kissinger as well. And yeah, in, in a few, a few uh, remarks just to uh, rectify what you said. Uh, Kriegspiel is it's all about military operations. Kriegspiel was a, you know, the, the, the Germans, the Prussians had the best land army for many decades, yeah. And uh, they were practicing by Kriegspiel, different versions of Kriegspiel. Kriegspiel was an instrument to exercise uh, the war maneuvers in peacetime. It, with years, it became a synonym of exercising and being good intellectually. Prefer, well, intellectually preferred warrior, and so on and so forth. And the Germans were really masters of land warfare. Their mastery lasted until May 1945. They really were very efficient at at, uh, at this sort of uh, you know craft, if I may say so. And that stemmed from many aspects, including the old school of Kriegspiel and how you train your officer corps and COs and so on and so forth. In terms of geopolitics, it's more complex. Geopolitics always, of course, existed because this is reality. And uh, major powers always follow the, the, no, the rules and the principles of geopolitics. Even if intellectuals or academia dismissed it after the Second World War, because it was uh, like you know German loss, so this Haushofer idea of Lebensraum and you know, but Marshall Plan was a purely geopolitical concept. It had to bind Western Europe with the U.S. with this market, the U.S. Uh, NATO also. I mean, the U.S. policy of the Second World War was a, well, it's all about geopolitics of the sea power. Actually, with two internal legs of the American power, Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean became the legs, uh, with the U.S. presence on both sides of Eurasia, uh, controlling the communication lines, being a permanent factor in Eurasia. It's all geopolitics, How, whatever you call it, okay? And we forgot about it over the last 30 years because the supremacy of the United States was so overwhelming that uh, we didn't feel this gravity and there was one set of rules one set of rules of trading of currency of military it was only the u.s power projection capabilities that were legitimate right iraq wars <laughs> other interventions on the periphery of terror, war on terror it was a sole superpower that's why different people from academia could venture into this beautiful statement that geopolitics is dead. It was dead because there was one atlas holding on its shoulders the gravity of the, of the world, and it was the United States, and especially its name, and a global power project. I'm telling you, if it's gone, we'll be again in the world of chaos. And it is palpable already on those uh, crash zones between the zone of influence of the U.S. by projection Eurasia. Like South China Sea, East China Sea, uh, Strait of Hormuz that we mentioned, and also here in the Intermarium, and between the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea. Yes, um, Intermarium was a, uh, a word which I 
maybe should have included because it's one that comes up. Um, but obviously, um, we we can still talk about those things um, in other um, parts of the um, uh, of the recording. The next um, word is one, and I'm going to reveal my own um, ignorance here. Um, it's one which I don't honestly know how to pronounce. It's uh, L is for I don't know if it's limes or limes. Li um, limes is okay. from Latin. Yeah? Okay. Uh, limes. Uh, I'm an old school, you know, guy. I, I learned Latin at school. Yeah. Limes meaning meaning boundaries of the Roman Empire. So there are always limes in our lives. And especially if you're a power, you have a sort of a zone of influence. That's what it is. Limas of the Western world right now are on the, are on the Bog River uh, and are on the boundaries of the Baltic State. And it's disputable and arguable whether Ukraine is within Limas of the Western world and out, or out of it, or in the gray zone. Actually, it's all about influence. There is a core being the United States and it imposes a set of rules and you follow and then you can peacefully rise and make your money and flourish. Our European Union and the limits of that is east of Polish borders. Now with the rise of China and the new revisionist policy of Russia, they want to change the limits. And again, as we said before, we are back into the geopolitical games. Perhaps um, a, a point of discussion um, for the listeners, uh, for commenters um, below the line, um, could be about Latin. Maybe Latin uh, should be compulsory in Polish primary schools. Maybe that would um, uh, uh, help educate the, the next generation. Um, Moving on to M. M is for Mar-a-Lago. Um, and by Mar-a-Lago, um, I mean um, Donald Trump, Donald Trump's presidency. Um, also, um, this is the place where Donald Trump um, stayed recently instead of um, visiting uh, Warsaw. So we missed him here because he was, um, he was uh, watching Mar-a-Lago to make sure that um, it didn't get... Um, destroyed by a hurricane, I believe. Um, can you talk a little bit about Donald Trump's um, presidency and uh, the relationship between the US and Poland um, under the, the Mar-a-Lago regime, as it were? Mar-a-Lago regime. Yeah, yeah. Mar-a-Lago means Donald Trump. And Donald Trump will come down to the records of history either as a guy who destroy the American supremacy by accelerating the process of removing US from the, posi the position of the top leader, or it will be remembered as a great hero of the United States that restored its supremacy, or at least that launched, I mean, came upon the road, upon the path of restoring it. Both, I mean, either that, Paradox, huh? I need to say about this person, all his rhetoric aside and all his faces aside and you know all those things that really don't matter. This guy initiated a great battle against China that I already had thought the Americans would not have the guts to, to stop. I was thinking that America was on decline in Eurasia. And Trump, and probably people around him, decided to make a statement and reverse this trajectory. Actually, it may bring quite a chaos, but still, he was the guy who initiated it. That's why I said that assessment of this person Maybe to fall. Either he will be remembered as a guy who will be remembered. 
accelerate the process of decline of the US and its influence in the world, or save it and restore the strength. That's what I think about my lago. <laughs> yeah, it brings us nicely on to the next, um, the next topic. Um, you talked about um, America versus China. Um, N is for nine dash line. Um, Steve Bannon um, is probably the um, the one person that's really pushed this uh, this narrative um, in in the media over the last few years um, about the U.S. being effectively at war in the South Ch- in the South China Sea. Um, can you can you tell us something about the Nine Dash Line? It's a Chinese concept uh, where the Chinese borders are in this South China Sea. Uh, it's uh, actually it's a historical uh, claim that South China Sea belongs to China, or to put it in the, to quote or paraphrase, I think that Chinese Ministry of Defense or Ministry of Foreign Affairs that South China Sea, as the name itself suggests, belongs to China. So, uh, and this is the, the concept to legitimize the, the, you know, with old maps and so on. Actually, Chinese view and see the South China Sea, like the Americans have seen the Caribbean, as the uh, sort of uh, entering room towards the Chinese mainland as a sort of a buffer, maritime buffer. You need to traverse the South China Sea to get to Europe, to the Indian Ocean, to the, to the uh, Middle East. That's why they need to secure, to feel that nobody has a leverage on their, on their future. They want to control it, and they want to remove the U.S. power projection from South China Sea. This is why they embarked on this ambitious uh, artificial island building process uh, that I call the strategy of maritime bastion. They want to create a fortress, a bastion in the sea to shoot at the approaching US Navy vessels just to show that they rule the South China Sea and they control this uh, body of water and other participants of this maritime highway of transportation of goods need to reckon that, okay? And uh, that's uh, that's what I uh, think about my dash line. I think um, probably a lot of our readers will have done uh, readers and listeners will have done this already. Um, but it's really interesting to go on the um, on Google Maps, for example, and look at the satellite imagery of the of the South China Sea to look at the Spratly Islands to see these artificial islands with. With military runways on, um, it looks um, it looks very um, impressive uh, from above. Um, staying on the topic of satellite imagery, um, it's very interesting to look at um, areas at night. And um, Peter Zion um, does this in one of his uh, one of his lectures, where he shows the map of uh, North America at night. And you can see lots of lights um, up in, I think it's um, maybe Alberta in, in Canada and um, Dakota in America, um, where it's the, um, the, the oil fields, I believe, or the shale uh, gas um, fields where there's a lot of drilling um, going on. America has recently um, become um, a, quite a big player in terms of the um, the energy market because of these um, these discoveries and because of the new technology. Um, and also, I think Poland um, is uh, is maybe a future player with the ports of uh, Spinuszcza. Um, so can we talk about um, oil and gas? And obviously that's because O is for oil and gas. Okay, it's all about resources. In order to feed your economy and to keep it going and to keep the social contract, you need to have the resources. There used to be different resources in the, in the past. Salt, uh, water, uh, water is always a resource. Uh, silver, gold, you know, to keep things going, you need resources. With the invention of the engine, combustion engine, you, you suddenly won't need oil. Uh, the gas also became in the 20th century primary factor in, in, in resources. And it gives energy 
So this is important. And in geopolitics, it means that you need to identify the places where those resources are, the powers that control those resources, and you need to have access to those resources, and you need to be supplied with these resources, and you need to keep in touch and a good contact with those powers that control both the access to it, the excavation of it, or drilling of it, and also the communication lines that uh, lead to you. Uh, and safe passage so that you can use it. And all powers strive to grow and influence all along those key critical tasks. Okay, so to control the, the supply chain, to control the the uh, arrival, to control the you know the also sometimes the places where it is excavated. This is all about the, it's about the essence of geopolitics. That's why certain places are more important than others. Strait of Hormuz, Iran, Iraqi, uh, Iraqi, oil, Iraqi oil fields, Saudi Arabia, uh, port facilities, and gas, of course, pipelines. This is all about strategic flows. They keep you going. If you, stop and you pause and you, you, you don't keep going, you lose, you get weaker. As simple as that. Okay, um, this is another one which um, I have no um, nothing to say about, no ability to even introduce this, so I'll just say P is for power projection. Of course, this is a, the favorite uh, notion of all monetary strategies and power and geopolitics. Okay, power projection may be divided into two parts. You, in order to have, inf it's all about influence. It's all about making things happen in line what you expect or how you want them to play out. So, in order to achieve that, especially if it's not or your your own home or house that you need to, for example, convince other nations to do, you need to project power. So you project power by having money, trading, technology, markets, uh, norms that they need to apply. And then you start to have influence on the behavior. This is projection of power. The ultimate instrument of power projection is the military. At the end of the day, if they don't, if they don't want to do as you wish, you impose on them by military power. And it's not about the evil behavior, because if you don't have your own military power, then those bad guys may impose on you, even if they don't have technology or other things, you know, and they can impose you. That's why you build your arms, to, and you need to project power. Of course, it's always quite easy to project power to your neighbor, but major power has cap financial capabilities and technological and organizational capabilities to project power over the vast distances. You, Great Britain was able to project power to Singapore, that is far, far away from Port, uh, Plymouth yeah? or London. So our United States can project power to Poland, to Taiwan, to Japan. They have even overseas bases. This is the power projection. And by being able to project power, they keep the whole world system stable. Because if they are seen in Japan, so Japan doesn't want to flip to the Chinese side. They are reassured that the system is working also for them. Okay, and this is all about power projection capabilities. And you need every day to make sure that your power projection capabilities are fine, <laughs> fine, and they are not mitigated, for example, by anti aerodynamic capabilities that Chinese or Russians are fielding. And this is all about this, you know, the balancing game here in Poland, for example. Okay, so P is for power projection. Um, it could equally be for Plymouth as well. Um, the next one is um, one which is Probably my um, my favourite um, in the in the whole um, A to Z because it's one which I really struggled to come up with um, an idea for, and um, when I finally uh, found it, it slotted in really nicely because um, I really wanted to talk about five G, 
um, and I wanted to find a way to do that using one of these uh, one of these letters. I didn't want to say H is for Huawei because that maybe would be a bit too obvious. So um, I'm really happy that I found Q is for Qualcomm. I believe this is the American um, manufacturer and provider supplier of uh, 5G networks. And I believe that Poland um, is uh, probably going to um, buy a 5G network from an American supplier or a Swedish supplier, certainly not from a Chinese um, supplier. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance of 5G? 5G is at the, at the uh, front line of the great power struggle in Malaysia. We had the trade war between US and China. We already had the propaganda war between them. We have a war over the social contract. We already have the currency war, in my opinion. And on, by all means, we have the technology war. The Americans are trying to sanction the development of the Chinese technology, and 5G is at the front final that and 5g potentially is the most important of it because it creates new connectivity new supply chains completely uh, changing the the way the industry will operate you know maybe not that far but it might resemble the invention of steam engine or combustion engine or switching from the coal and to coal uh, coal engines of the Royal Navy to the oil, uh, oil put, you know, propelled uh, ships uh, that happened at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. And the Chinese are good at it. And that uh, not only will create huge yields and profits for the Chinese companies, but also will create new influences, new supply chains, New subcontractors, new companies, new tech companies, new iPhones, uh, I mean, not iPhones, new cell phones. Who knows what else? And it will not be the American companies. And it will not be about the American power. So it's all about power. And the Americans are really pressing the allies to ban the Huawei and the Chinese fight. We'll see how it play out. But this is the epicenter of the struggle. Okay, um, we have maybe briefly mentioned the idea of Heartland, um, which uh, came earlier with Alfred and Kinder. Uh, now we can perhaps talk a bit about Rimland. So R is for Rimland. Um, can you explain to us what, what this is? Yeah, Rimland, Rimland uh, areas, uh, the, the, I think it's both concept of Mackinder and, and Spikeman, and the strategy, both Spikeman and um, American strategies of Dutch origin that died in the 40s of the 20th century. And actually he, he created this, I mean, he invented intellectually the system that was applied later on in the Cold War by the US uh, State Department and Pentagon. And it lasts until today. Greenland countries are countries that are open to the, to the world ocean. They are connected, they have ports, they have coastline. They are then under the influence of the dominant sea power because their strategic flows are allowed by the by the dominant sea power like western europe or japan or uh, you know and, and, and usually they form the alliance right now during this current era that is in favor of the u.s supremacy and the united states created uh, alliances in the eurasia and greenland trying to contain Soviet Union. And now they are trying to do sort of the same against China. Okay, this brings us quite nicely to the next point, which is S is for string of pearls. Uh, maybe I'll give a brief introduction to this idea. It's nice if you if you don't know what string of pearls um, means in terms of geopolitics, it's a good idea to, um, to search it on the internet and find some image of it because it looks nice. Um, I'll, I'll try and explain it though. It's it's this idea of a map of um, I believe Southeast Asia with all of the key ports that are connected um, by it looks like a necklace, um, and this is a strategic um, concept of the I guess the Chinese um, 
the, the Chinese government, the Chinese Navy. Um, so S is for string of pearls. Would you, uh, would you go so far as to include the port of Piraeus in the string of pearls, potentially? Maybe, maybe the port of Piraeus in Greece will be a terminal uh, point of the string of pearl connectivity. Uh, we mentioned Malacca Strait, we mentioned this uh, enclosure sort of containment by the US. In order to break through, the Chinese will need to develop a maritime strategy in the Indian Ocean with a, with a basis of facilities that will support the, the fleet, the Chinese fleet, yeah, so that this communication line is secure and under the control of the Chinese. So this is all about building and for facilities, <laughs> Badar, Sri Lanka, Djibouti, the Piraeus and others that the Chinese simply will have to, to do in order to, to feel more and more secure and then deliver the Belt and Road Initiative. Okay, T is for Tiananmen. Again, I will give a brief introduction here. Um, obviously Tiananmen Square um, and by extension, we can also perhaps talk about the Maidan in Kiev um, and the idea of the square as a place. Um, and obviously, along with the square, we have its corollary, the tower. Um, Neil Ferguson has, um, has written and talked very eloquently about the relationship between the square and the tower. Um, can you explain uh, this, uh, this concept? Yeah, but let me start with the skin on men thing. Yeah, usually people gather at uh, squares. You have space there. So people are heard, listened to. They can exchange views. And the on men has probably two dimensions. First of all, of course, we all remember the massacre of students in, in, in the on men. But also, uh, it was the on men square where Mao Zedong uh, announced that uh, the new China uh, is sort of coming to life again. It's coming, it's rising from its knees. I think that's a quote. After 100 years of humiliation, also from the hands of the British, by the way, and, and other people from the West and from Russia and Japan. So uh, again, it's square that things happen. And this uh, opposition between the square and the tower is simple and at the same time quite deep and profound. And this all thanks to the brilliant observations by now Ferguson. Square is uh, is the tower. I mean, the tower is the uh, where the authority rests. It's the government. It's the bureaucracy. It's where people uh, compete for decision making process, and they make things happen on the surface of the of the earth. But it's a very nasty place. Usually, it's a very vertical line of connectivity. I mean. You know, like in line with uh, Machiavelli's prince. It, it, it's not entirely ethical what's happening there, so to speak. And so you, you, you need to understand this power struggle. The gossip, uh, you know, different things, whatever you, you call libel, you know, the different things, but miles. But still, the, the, the tower is implementing reforms. It has the power. It monopolizes the violence as well. While the square is a congregation of people that are interested in things, that they want something new, that they galvanize debate, they spur to action, they they try to influence the tower. Sometimes, uh, sort of trying to slate, yeah, to, to move this tower to, to, to the other side. It's like the early Christians, uh, Hussites. Uh, Protestant movement, uh, many other things, even social media now. People exchange views, people read, people know, people think their brains are working and they influence the tower. So there is always this opposition between the tower and the square. The rules of the game and the rules of the world are different. In the square, people don't kill each other, they don't remove each other, they simply galvanize. There is more glory in it, but less power. While in the tower, there is more power and less glory. And trying to combine those two, this is the, you know, this is a task. Um, yeah, the, I think Neil Ferguson is, um, is a great communicator. Um, he actually starts his um, talk about the square and the tower 
by referencing Piazza del Campo in, in Siena. And I think it's, it's nice for people to have um, some kind of um, mental image uh, to connect with, uh, with these big ideas that, that we have so many of. Um, moving on, we mentioned, um, we've talked a lot about China um, and tea was for Tiananmen. Um, also, the Maidan um, is an important square and this uh, brings us on nicely to uh, you, which is for Ukraine. Ukraine is a critical country for the security of Poland. It resembles the revolving door. If Ukraine is with Russia, Russia is a major power in Europe. If Ukraine is independent, Russia is an Eurasian, rather, you know, not so relevant country. For Poland, Ukraine means independence. That's why we have had 23 wars with Russia over the future of the landmass that's called today Ukraine. We went to war over Ukraine so many times, including 1920. I mean, there are many things to say about this place, but this is a pivotal place right now. And if Eurasia is on the rise, it will be even more so in the coming years. Mm -hmm. um, v is for Venice. Um, the, the reason V is for Venice um, is because uh, Venice used to be obviously a place where strategic flows um, conver converged. And this is something that I think you can really get a sense of in the works of Shakespeare. Um, Shakespeare has, I think, Othello, The Merchant of Venice, um, plays which are set in, um, in Venice. And obviously, because it's Shakespeare's Venice, um, there's some, a little bit of London in there as well. And London obviously replaced Venice as the main place in Europe where strategic flows converged. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk a bit about Venice or we can maybe move on to, to W. Um, no, Venice is the perfect stuff. Venice shows the uh, futurist nature of geopolitics. For 400 years, Venice was a great trading sea-oriented city with the largest fleet in the Mediterranean and with a full fledged versatile contacts in the Arab and Byzantine world. It simply controlled the terminal point of this whole circle. And now a tricky part. Once and you know and it accumulates wealth and so on. Once the brave Christopher Columbus and his followers and all those people that followed his footsteps secure, established and secured the communication lines across the Atlantic, the new poles of trade were made. Venice died. It could do nothing to change this geographical location. The Eastern Mediterranean was dying out and the future of Venice looked blank. And this is what happens, how the gravity changes everything and imposes structurally on the correlation of power. The same thing is happening now with a shift from the Atlantic to the Pacific as a center of gravity of the things that are happening in the world. So we'll see what's going to happen to Great Britain then. Mm -hmm. We, uh, yeah, I think uh, VS for Venice moves us really nicely onto the next topic, uh, which can be introduced by W is for Warsaw. This is something which I've been um, desperate to um, to ask you about. I don't want to talk about obviously when we when we think about Warsaw, we often think about its history, um, possibly about its present as well, because um, Warsaw's um, a great bustling um, place. What I'd like to ask you about is the future of Warsaw and um, the, maybe the expansion out into, um, into places like Baranov and um, the idea of Warsaw as the new Venice, a place where in the future strategic flows will be increasingly 
um, concentrated? It is the most difficult question so far because I had a personal attachment. I was born here and I grew up here and I live here in this city that was treated, uh, let me say, in a, in, in a different, differently in different periods of time by history. But for sure, uh, it, it felt the impact of uh, history events and geopolitics. I think that the future for wars is bright. It is, it is lying in the main hub of Swedish flows across northern European plain, controlling the crossing across the Vistula River in a very good position, more or less in the central place in the country, with a huge population base, open up to all directions, anchoring the Baltic state, Belarus, and Ukraine to the European peninsula. And you can see it from the communication system. And it also has a huge catchment area, for example, for, for air flights. Uh, and that's why Poles are building this massive uh, airport next to Warsaw, I mean, close to Warsaw. So the future is broad, I think. Uh, the more connectivity, the better it would be for Warsaw. Mm -hmm. But we will see whether the great storms of geopolitics and the scaling of globalization will not stop this connectivity to materialize. X is for Xi, as in Xi Jinping. Um, in geopolitics, there is a belief that the, um, the individual leaders are not important. Um, so in that context, um, do you think Xi Jinping um, is important in terms of his, uh, his personality? Is he the, the decision maker? How much of the, the future depends on, on one person? Let me correct you know, this opinion about job of individuals are very important. Even more so, even more so because they have a few inches of maneuver space. Because this is the limit imposed by the geopolitics. So individual humans are even more important because you can really maneuver this small space in a different way. But still you need to understand that you have, you know, little maneuver space. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And Xi Jinping is a good example. An emperor of China, so to speak. Lifetime emperor. Always facing potential rivalry within the system, fractions, revolutions, calls, uh, assassinations, plots against him. I cannot even imagine what sort of pressure, internal pressure, he needs to shoulder every day running a billion for 400 million population and 2000 years of imperial history i am i just finished reading uh, stalin's uh, biography by stephen Hawking, and stalin had to and had was his despot running this country but china is many times bigger that's it and now there is much more money than it was ever been has ever had ever been in soviet union so there are more and more interactions. It must be quite a difficult job to, to, do, to do. You mentioned Stalin, which um, could bring us on to the next topic of why is for Yalta. Um, equally, we could talk about the Black Sea. Um, we could talk about this idea of Yalta 2.0, 2. 2. Um, the idea of a new, um, a new arrangement between the um, between America and, um, and and Russia regarding uh, Eastern Europe, so I'll let you decide which to, which of these to talk about. So why is for Yalta? Yalta is for a beautiful resort on the Black Sea coast, where the three leaders of the alliance in the Second World War met and divided the world in zones of influence. But for Poles and the people living between the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea, we call it the intermarine people. 
uh, where we belong, it will always be remembered as a treason. And we were simply left over fighting against Germans since they won. And still, because of the correlation of power and the rules of geopolitics that are very, you know, south and grim, we were completely out of the, you know, we were thrown under the bus. Yeah, so to speak. And that lasted for another four decades where we couldn't prosper. We were under the Soviet region. So this is all about that. Okay, which brings us to uh, the final letter of the alphabet. Um, Z is for Jolibosch. Um, that's Z with a dot on top. Um, this is a district of, uh, of Warsaw, um, which I believe is your um, the district that you grew up in. Yes, I, I grew up here. So, um, and actually, for our listeners to know, and we are talking right now, sitting in a, you know, Green Gardens of Zoribosz. Uh, Zoribosz uh, is uh, very well known across Poland for having beautiful villas, green gardens, very tranquil, quiet place, but close to the downtown, where people really want to, to spend time. Okay, and um, on the, uh, I think, Z is for Zoribosz can, um, is a nice way to, uh, to end the conversation for listeners that um, that maybe hopefully are listening to us for the for the first time and, and don't know um, much about us and the reason that we're doing this, maybe you can um, tell listeners a bit about strategy and future. Strategy and future is the um, uh, concept of uh, providing people that will read us and listen to us with the essence of knowledge about uh, how the world is ruled how the affairs of the international arena are governed and decided and resolved. We want to bring you closer to the first row in the theater of the things that are playing out uh, right in front of our eyes. Suddenly, in the noise of the popular broadcast media, you can't see it. We want to bring you closer. We want to really show you the real mechanisms. Our motto is now you know, and we want really to speak to it. Jacek Bartoszek, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Thomas. That's been great.